This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Now, my guest today is not my normal sort of somebody in the go, say, engineering space. Uh, I've got a really special guest today. His name is Steve Waselku. Did I say that right? Steve Waselku. You got it. Okay, perfect. And Steve is um, actually of a different sort of background. I'm going to let Steve kind of tell you what he's doing today. So, Steve, let's just start off. Give everybody like two minutes on what you're doing today. Sure. So a little bit about me and my company. My name's Steve Wasselkiu. I'm 36. I'm a multifamily syndicator here in San Diego. So pretty much we invest in real estate and uh, we'll pull funds in order to buy uh, multifamily properties for the most part. We do have some other type of rental classes that we invest in, but that's what we're focusing mostly in now. Um, my company is Magna Vita Investments, which actually translates to great life in Latin. And we pretty much provide people with an alternative to stock market investing. So we own property. We own property here in San Diego and uh, Chicago. And in the portfolio right now, we have short term rentals, medium term rentals and long term rentals. I think I've seen I'm totally not versed in this space here, but I think I've seen this idea is where you're you're buying properties and you're generating, I guess, revenue from the property itself and rents. And then you're bundling that into like an investment sort of vehicle. So if I wanted to invest in that, I could. Yeah, correct. So there's a minimum amount that you would need to put into the deal and then you would get an X return. So we usually try to target like anywhere from a 12% to an 18% return for anybody that's putting money into the deal. How are you generating those returns? You're not selling the properties is it all so eventually we will sell and that is part of the return but the rents are have to be over you know the mortgage and the expenses to produce the cash flow okay brilliant i i got a ton of questions but we're gonna get to them <laughs> at the end dude. i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it all back at the back at the end i i i'm really kind of interested how you got here and for those of everybody listening to, I find it, I, I've been in tech my whole life, right? Steve, I'm 53 years old. I, I've, I've been, I've lived a comfortable life in tech and I, I see where like the money is there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm always fascinated by how people make money outside of tech. I don't know why I'm always fascinated. Like I'm in Miami, dude. I drive by Star Island and I look at the house that nobody, somebody owns and is never there. That drives me crazy too, right? <laughs> the, the, these uber, uber wealthy people, they buy these homes and they're never using them. But I still wonder like, how, what did you do to get to that level? Like, did you make the, the little umbrella that's in my mixed drink? Like somebody, <laughs> somebody cleaned up on the umbrella, right? Like they can manufacture that. I was in Miami last year just for a couple of days and we did the little boat tour. And I mean, those houses are like J-Lo and The Rock, you know, like those are big stars. So. Actually, you know what? They don't live there because of those boats. Those are like their vacation properties. But you can't sit outside because those boats are going by it all. I think I don't remember what star it was. I don't know if it was Sylvester Stallone or somebody, but they bought a house there. And like two days later, they were like, no, I'm done because <laughs> you just can't be outside like enjoying it. Um, but it's still mind blowing to me. Like the, the economy is so large. There's so much money in it yep. that um, there's lots of ways that you can like earn a living. And oh, for sure. OK, so I want to jump you back in the time machine, Steve. Let's do it. And to do that, I need to know when you graduated high school and where in the country were you? So I grew up in Southern California um, in Mission Viejo and Rancho Santa Margarita area. Graduated high school 04, graduated college in 08. I went to San Diego State 
Thought, uh, I mean, don't, 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 don't jump ahead of me now, Steve. You, you, you <laughs> heard a couple shows here, right? Don't ruin that. Okay, you know, that just didn't happen from birth, dude. There's a story there. We got to, we got to get there. But 2004 okay. oh, is good. Man, we're going deep. Oh, no, no, we're going. Uh, you don't know what you just got into, Steve. So, <laughs> <Let's do it. laughs> This is like <laughs> this is like if we met at a bar and it was just like, tell me a story, right? Like that, that that's that's what we're gonna do. Okay, two thousand and four. Let me I gotta put that in my head. Just just to let you because Steve and I don't really know each other at all. I, I graduated high school in nineteen eighty seven, Steve. So this is I'm just gonna age myself. I was born in eighty six. Okay, there it is. So <laughs> you were born a year before I graduated high school and my uh I, I always say it this way. I manage seven kids. So um, number five was born in 2003. So it gives me a general sense of when you graduated high school. Yeah, Steve's like, what? What's, if you're not watching YouTube, Steve, Steve is, yeah. <laughs> Watch <laughs> YouTube. Uh, that's why I say manage seven. And I've numbered them, Steve. I don't even call them by name. It's no names, name one, just numbers. Two, like no, it's just too hard. The greatest was when number six started no yeah number seven started calling number six number six oh my god and number six looked at her and said do not use my number <laughs> and i just knew like i won at that moment okay <laughs> so 2004 southern california you're graduating high school i i wanna now you're you're in real estate right so i'm kind of really interested i guess talk a little bit about as you're entering high school, like what are some of the things you're interested in? Are you like everybody's either sports, maybe music, theater, clubs? Like I, I don't know, but uh, give me a general sense of like Steve entering ninth grade. Like what's what's on your radar at that time? Yeah, um, mostly sports, honestly. No, no tech, no real estate, no anything. I, I'm like 13 years old, right? Yeah. So. yeah. Nobody's thinking real estate at, at <laughs> no. 13. No. I, I, I'm wondering what your parents sort of do for a living too, because that's times that, that can kind of also set direction. So yeah. yeah, I mean, sports. Okay. Which makes sense, right? Sports Southern in California. Um, but what are your parents also kind of doing at the time? Sure. So um, mom was a pharmacist by trade, dad engineer by trade. Um, dad got more into the side of business though, for engineering, not so much like hands on the ground. So maybe that kind of steered me into business a little bit. I'm not sure. The pharmacist stuff is interesting. I, I, I talked to somebody who transitioned from like pharmacy tech into engineering level tech. I mean, there's a lot on that pharmacy side. I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. Your father on the engineer, do you remember what kind of business that was from an engineering perspective? So, yeah, so he was a mechanical engineer, but then he got into oil and gas. Uh, he worked for Shell for a long time, and then he got into um, the gold mining industry, actually. And they had a company that was based out of, I think it was like Kazakhstan or like China or something like that. Oh, so like minerals outside the U.S. sort of. Yeah. Yeah, he had, he had worked overseas for a while too. God, I knew uh, I knew a guy that was like the CEO of a billion dollar mining company at some point. God, I can't remember the name of the company, but I found that to be super like this is like this is the thing. Like of course there's got to be companies that are like digging minerals out of the ground and well we don't have anything, but you don't think about that as a business. I don't. I don't think that even exists. Okay. <laughs> The moment you said gold in California, I was thinking the moment like TLC, I don't know what it was, TLC or Discovery put that gold rush show on. I was like, are people still trying to dig gold out of the ground in California? Like what's going on here? Um, up in the Yukon, it's Alaska <laughs> stuff. Is that Alaska? I never watched the show because I just thought it was like just ridiculous. But... I've watched it. It's, yeah, it's all in Alaska. It's actually a pretty, pretty decent show. <laughs> yeah, I might have to. I, I, I don't know. I just thought like, really, we're digging for gold. St but I guess do people actually get gold? Like, oh, they, yeah, they're, they're killing it. Really? So Steve, why are we why are we not up there then? Steve, what's going on here? dude? Let's buy some real estate in Alaska on top of a gold mine. <laughs> it's freezing. Yeah, that's why I'm in Miami, dude. I grew up in New York. And I said, I'm going to Miami. And I'm done with the cold. Yeah. Why did you have to bring that up? I was getting all excited. And now I just remember it's cold. You're in high school. You're playing sports. Probably all you're really kind of focused on. But say, but how about like acad academics wise? Were there any subjects that were kind of interesting to you or you just fought through English, math and science? And 
I didn't think any of it was interesting at all. <laughs> Honestly, I got like a three, like a three, 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 four, something like that. Like decent, make sure my parents didn't yell at me too much. And that was it. Okay. See, I was like a C student my whole life. Cause I was so really immature at the time in high school. I totally hated everything related. I liked everything about school, even in university that had nothing to do with class. And I was, I was also young when I went to school. I was like a year behind everybody. I was immature, but it sounds like, so in other words, I didn't get a three, three, right? <laughs> but you did probably with minimal effort. So I feel like then the, 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 the schooling and the subject matter wasn't really complicated for you. You just, you did what you had to do to get by and you had good, good, got good grades. It, it was all right. It was more just so I didn't get beat at home. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, I mean, my number four and five didn't really care <laughs> at the end about getting yelled at. I'll tell you that much. If anything, it was almost like they um, they wanted me to start screaming. I don't know. So <laughs> I don't know when that changed, Steve. I don't know when it changed to like, I just don't want to be hassled by my parents to I literally don't care if I get hassled. <laughs> so that means now you're going through high school, you're just, you want to do your thing. Uh, so then at some point you have to decide what you want to do after high school. Is it just foregone conclusion you're going to university or were there other choices that you had? So like when you're that young, it's really just how your parents frame things, right? So it was never, do you want to go to college? It's what college are you going to? <laughs> so there's no choice like in your, in your little adolescent brain, right? Like, oh, I don't need to go to college. That's not even the choice. So I applied to a couple schools um, my brother, I have an older brother, um, and he went to San Diego State. So I kind of just followed him down there. But it doesn't sound like you were necessarily excited or not excited. It was just the next step, right? It was the same thing for me. It was like, that's the next step. I, no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was undeclared as a major, no clue. So then you, you enter university, and I've said this on other shows before, that that first year is kind of like... You don't realize it when you're there. You realize it later. It's that kind of first year of discovery. Where you're like, damn it, man. Why don't I got to take some psychi psychology class? Why is sociology class? This is a waste of my time. But when you step back, you start to realize it was kind of nice that we did that because it introduced you and opened you up to some other things. So were there classes, at least your freshman or even, I guess, sophomore year that kind of started getting you focused around what you wanted to do? No, not really. <laughs> I, I liked philosophy a lot, but I didn't think I wanted to do it forever. And then I just ended up thinking business. I was like, you can apply it to pretty much anything. Um, so I went for that. I had the same experience with the philosophy. I, I think because I like to debate and it was almost a debate class in a sense, but it's the same thing. Like it's not a career path, but I probably did well in that class too. I, I, I did enjoy it. What aspects of that class do you think you enjoyed? Was it a debate? Was it just the conversations? I think it's just going deeper than I've ever gone and just having somebody kind of challenge my beliefs a bit. It sounds to me, right? Because by the time you finish your second year, you're supposed to have some clue on what you're going to major in. Sounds like Steve is still just kind of just passing time here, uh, keeping parents at bay and adults at bay just so they're not hassling you. But I also imagine you have to work a little bit harder in college than you did in high school to keep the grades up, but you're doing that. Yeah, I end up great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, talk to me about that. You, you, you do graduate, right, from, from San Diego State. Do you graduate with a major or do you just graduate? I don't even know how you graduate without a major, so. Yeah, no, I, I, declared, I declared second semester of freshman year, I think. So I, I did cho choose business. I chose business management did that whole program, maybe thought two classes were useful, honestly, finance and then um, business law. Those were the most useful classes to me. Everything else was whatever. At the time you thought it was useful. I mean, you could look back now and say it was, but at the time, I mean, you didn't know what was going to be useful or not. At the time I knew the finance class was because we were talking about amortizing mortgages. We we're actually talking about real estate, things that are applicable to everyday life. Your father's not into real estate. So I'm trying to pull out of you, Steve, when mm -hmm. the thought of real estate is starting to enter your mind. You just mentioned it now with your finance class, but when does, does any of that end up 
starting to hit into your radar at university or you just know I'm going to have to graduate. Maybe I want to be an entrepreneur. Are you thinking I want to be an entrepreneur and not have to work for anybody? Nope, not even thinking that. So I didn't buy my first property until I was 26. All right. So what happens then once you graduate from San Diego State with your business degree? Like what's the next sort of step for you? Yeah. So I graduated in 08, which was just the dump of the economy, right? Like this is the great financial crisis and I'm graduating into this. So I'm like, I need to pay my rent. Like dad gave a couple thousand outside of school. Like, hey man, good luck. Go get a job. Like it's on you now. So I'm like, oh crap. So <laughs> sending off hundreds of resumes, monster.com, indeed, anything. Can't get an interview to save my life. I'm like selling sports supplements, like cold calling people to buy like real estate websites to realtors and stuff. Like no idea what, what I'm doing. But what companies are you throwing? Wait, 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 slow down. So I'm going to do this all, all the time. You're throwing your, 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 you're throwing your resume everywhere. And absolutely in 2008, we have the, the financial crisis because of the way they were wrapping up mortgages as investments and everybody foreclosing left and right. But I'm curious what companies and jobs you were applying to at the time. Yeah, good question. Um, everything so i'm talking like department of defense contractors like anything in san diego like healthcare jobs like in in admin you know like i'm I'm 21 no experience no no anything so anything that will literally pay me a wage <laughs> did you ever consider i did so when i graduated at the end of 91 we were also in some weird financial state i don't i don't remember what it was it took me eight months to find a job but i got into my head from some newspaper advertisement that there were jobs in Australia that weren't getting fulfilled. And then the other thing that they mentioned was that it was like eight women to every guy or something. Like that. <laughs> I don't remember. And my brain went, I want to go to Australia. That's so, a good ratio. So I paid, I don't know how much money I paid, 50 bucks or something. And I got a book from them with every company in Australia, like tech company in Australia. So I sent like 50 resumes out. I didn't get any interest, unfortunately, but <laughs> did you ever consider like maybe looking outside the U.S. at the time for work at that point? I, I didn't. Um, so while I was in university, my mom passed. Um, so that was really hard. And I didn't want to be far away from my brother or my family. Like I kind of needed that closeness to them. So that was never an option for me. OK, gotcha. So. You, you're throwing your resume out. You're throwing it to like, you're literally throwing it anywhere and everywhere. You just want this Hundreds. first job to get going. Okay, two questions. How many companies did you end up getting a, a call back? Yeah, maybe five, maybe five. Five. And out of those five, did you end up working at any of those five? Yeah, I probably got like two or three interviews and ended up getting a, a job. Yeah. And how long did that take from the time of graduating? Six months, maybe. But you didn't give up. Like, so what is Steve doing for six months? <laughs> right. Eating <While> ramen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because you still have your own place and you have to pay. Dude, it's like you're back in college. And you just left <laughs> yeah. college. But, I mean, I was, yeah, I was still only 21. So. But $2,000, a couple thousand dollars wasn't going to pay rent for six months. Steve, no, so. no, definitely not. You must be working some odd jobs prior to getting this. So that's when I'm like cold calling people if they want to buy like sports supplements and stuff like that. You paid an hourly and some commission, I guess, if you. Yeah. Well, back then, man, that's like we're talking $10 an hour, Yeah. you know. <laughs> Sitting in a big sort of warehouse of uh, call centers or you could do that at home. A whole bunch, of, whole bunch of guys trying to sell sports supplements. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm thinking of these movies now. Uh, <laughs> like Boiler guys Room? Selling yeah that's it that was the one in my head except uh except they're selling like you know uh pink sheets or something but that's what i'm picturing steve so is this just like a boiler room for for supplements it was it was so i was in the boiler room for sports supplements and then after that, <laughs> and then after that got old for like three months then i ended up going into a, a boiler room of real selling realtor websites so we're just like literally cold calling like 200 realtors every single day ac across the nation like just bugging the hell out of them to buy websites it was like the most ridiculous job ever oh my god dude 
Um, <laughs> but always, always be closing, Steve. Always be closing, man. ABC, always be closing. Coffee's, so now- coffee's for closers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love, I can see you right now. Do you, you, if anybody's watching, if you're not watching the YouTube, you have to watch, uh, just because I can see Steve. I can see Ben Affleck walking in right now, screaming at Steve, ABC, <laughs> ABC. Okay, so you moved to um, this trying to sell white labeled websites for realtors. How does that work out, Steve? Uh, that's crap. I lasted like lasted like three or four months. So I was like, this is stupid. Uh, but you're paying rent, right? So I was. I was paying rent. So you're paying rent, and you. That's, so you have these sort of two interim jobs, and then finally somebody decides they're going to take a chance on Steve. So who who hired you now? So I ended up working for a small commercial risk management firm in San Diego, super small, mom and pop, like six employees, something like that. And so we're doing like risk management for companies, like consulting, we're doing commercial insurance and benefits for them. And what's your job there? I'm an account manager there. So I'm like pushing a lot of paper pretty much. You're managing their clients. Managing clients, yeah. And making sure that they're getting what they need from all of the the six people that are that are in there. Yeah, pretty much. Did they like hand you the clients day one or were you also responsible for bringing in new? Yeah, uh, I didn't start bringing in new clients until probably like year three. So year two is just kind of like learning what's going on, how to be an employee for the first time in my life. So like a, a real full time, full time white collar employee. Yeah. Yeah, but you got health benefits now, right? So you, know, you can't go wrong with that. You weren't expected to grow. Well, you weren't expected to grow clients, but I guess at some point you also learned how to sell new products and services to help generate more revenue, at least with the existing clients. Yeah, I, I did. And I mean, honestly, I make fun of the boiler room stuff, but you do kind of build up resilience doing that. And you do learn a little bit of a skill set. So I, I kind of talk crap on it, but some of that stuff even translates still today. So one of my business partners who handles the sales, I laugh a lot of times because if you say no to him, he kind of like laughs at it. Like you say no to me and I'm like, oh, right. You let, you say no to him. He just laughs at you. He's like, okay, I'll talk to you tomorrow. No, no, you're not <laughs> listening. Um, we're done. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And he will reach out. To, I've had friends that would have to say, Bill, can you please get Miguel off of me? Like you got to have a personality to just be like rejected all day with the idea that they're not really like, it's not a permanent no. It's just, just no right now. But I think that takes a special personality. I think, I don't think some of that is learned. Like I've been in business for a long time and I still hate, I don't want to be, okay, maybe this is the difference. And I love your thoughts on this. I don't like being a bother to people. And if somebody's saying no to me, I just take that as we're done where Miguel doesn't take it the same way. It's not that he's being a bother to you. Um, he, you just don't know that you need this yet. So we're just going to keep talking. I, I don't know if that can be, I don't know if I could be rewired, you know, like, so when people are saying no to you, how do you take that? Do you take it personally or are you able to just say, okay, we'll talk tomorrow? Yeah, I, I don't take it personally, but I don't do the infinite follow up either. You know, I provide as much value as I can up front. I can eat, pump some urgency and scarcity with the deals, which is usually real. And then maybe one, maybe two follow-ups max. And then I'm not going to waste my time either. There's plenty of fish in the sea. And what I have to offer is valuable. So why am I going to like run somebody down over this? You know, what we have found, at least in tech, and we're, I'm in like consulting, contracting, training sort of in tech. We've also learned, though, that it's the long-term relationship that matters at the end of the day. So even if they say no, and, and maybe six months from now. Mm-hmm now is a good time for you too. So I, I imagine you've, you learned some of that in those years as well. Like, okay, it's no today, but tomorrow is, or six months from now is a different, like you don't want to lose that relationship, right? Well, and then like psychologically, we need to, 
I'm going to use the word touched by a person, but they have to see you a certain amount of times or they need to hear you. A lot of people won't buy from you the first time. So doing things like this, like podcasts and getting your face and your name out there just builds up your exposure, which makes people feel more comfortable doing business with you. Would you consider this position at this small company? I guess it's a, it's not really a sales position, right? It's a service, a customer service position with some amount of sales only when your client said, hey, do you have anything to solve this problem? Yeah, the first two years, no. And then later, as I evolved in that position and positions after that, it was more selling. So you're there for how many years were you at this first company? Was there four years? Yeah, that's a long time, dude. You gave you gave four years of uh, your your life there, right? So now it's like, it's, I mean, you got that in say 2008-ish. So now it's like 2012-ish. Why do you leave in four years? This does an opportunity for something new come up? Yeah, there was just no room for growth. The place wasn't big enough and they didn't want to like, I don't know, give any more value to me. So I just had to move on. All right. So you just, you were just like, I've done everything I'm going to do here. And that's, that's okay. It was, a, you know, just leave amicably. No, but that's fair. But you left without having another gig. No, I did have another gig. Okay. So, so what's the, what's your next sort of challenge after that it was working with uh one of their competitors as as an underwriter so i'm like underwriting accounts and they knew you were going to the competitor so i imagine that that was all done with yes it's okay but this is a completely different role steve this isn't handling clients and stuff explain again what you're doing there now <laughs> um, yeah that? so so now i'm i'm like underwriting pretty much policies for commercial insurance so if a contractor is working on like a constructing a big building, they need to have certain coverages in place to make sure if the place falls over, they have liability if somebody dies on the site. So I'm like underwriting their operations to make sure that they can pretty much be covered. Yeah, but where did the experience for doing underwriting come from? Because that's not what you're doing for the last four years. Um, I was doing a little bit of it, but not a ton. So the, the new job trained me a little bit. But I feel like you're a people person, Steve. And now what you've done is you've moved yourself into a basement with computer screens and paper. And the only people you talk to are the people trying to get you to say yes so they can close the deal. Uh, maybe. That's it? Maybe? Like, you, did, you, did you enjoy that job? It was all right. I mean, pretty much what I'm doing is like making a decent life for myself at this point. I'm still learning who I am, what I'm good at, and then saving this cash from these jobs to buy my first property at 26. So that's like where we're coming up on in the timeline right now. So you're not spending a lot of the money you're, you're, you're making in salary. You're, you're trying to live on a, as if you're still in university. So you've got like the table. Uh, yeah. I've always been a good, good saver. So like when I told you about my parents, my parents split when I was really young and they pretty much bankrupted each other through the divorce. So I grew up like very meager means, like despite the professions that they were in, and my dad didn't really hit a stride later until later in life. So um, grew up super modest. I was always a good saver and like knew I wanted like kind of a better life for myself. So let me just, are you, from a percent perspective, are you able to save 20% of your paycheck? Oh, way, way more than that. At, at some points I'm saving like 70, 80%. Wow. So you're really like for, for the, for these essentially, how long are you at the second company for? I guess two years, two, like two years. So for these six years, you're literally eating ramen every day. You're going out to, you're not going out to, I mean, you had to go out with your friends at some point, or grab some beers. Yeah, I'm going out with my friends, but it, it's mostly keeping the living expenses really low. So when my friends are living at the beach, I'm living more inland, I'm paying half the price. And then I'll go party with them, I'll sleep on their couch, and then I'll be banking the cash. And so is there, from the time you start, okay, where within the first six, in these six years, when does the thought of, I want to buy, I want to own some real estate come from, and when does that thought pop in your head and why does it? I mean, I know you saw an infomercial watching Gold Rush, I mean, Gold Rush wasn't there yet, but you saw an infomercial that said you could buy real estate with somebody else's cat. No, right? So how does it pop in your head? At, at that point, it's really just like being in control of your life, not having a landlord. I wanted that control. Um, and then I knew you could do something that some people now call ha house hacking. So you buy the property, you put in someone else into the uh, spare room, which almost pays your mortgage fully. So once I end up buying that first property, my first roommate that I found is pretty much paying for the whole place almost. 
But I, I still want to get back with when did the idea of doing that pop in your head? I don't know, man. <laughs> that's hard to that's that's hard to answer. I really don't. I mean, going back like 10, 11 years, I, I think it was more of just I think it wasn't so much as investing or making money. It was just being more in control of my life, honestly, and not having landlords jack up rent or tell you to do this or you need to move out, stuff like that. So the idea was to have control of your life you needed to own your home. Yeah, I think that's where it started. Okay, so I needed to buy a house so I could own this and nobody could ever control what I'm, okay. So you are you start saving a ton of money to be able to, are you saving enough money to buy the house cash or enough for the down payment? Oh no, just a down payment, yeah, not cash, definitely not cash. Your idea is I'm gonna buy this house and I'm gonna rent out the other room to a stranger to help Pay with the mortgage. Now that's interesting to me because you're living in the house, it's your house, but now you're going to invite somebody you don't know in the house to live there. I mean, is there any sort of reservation about that? No, it's, it's all good. So how do you find? Yeah. So I think it was just living with the roommates throughout college and after college. I'm like, yeah, just everybody has a roommate here because it's a somewhat expensive city to live in. And I didn't even buy a house. I bought a condo. It's like a two bedroom, two bath condo. But but how do you go about finding a person that you can, because once they're in, dude, they're in, there's no getting rid of them. Yeah. It's, it was Craigslist. I put a post on Craigslist and then I interviewed, interviewed them and then you should see Kevin's eyes right now. Kevin's <laughs> eyes, he's young, he's in university. His eyes popped out of his head, dude. Yeah, so you make him fill, up, you make him fill out an application, you run their background check, and then you hope for the best. <laughs> because especially in California, like if this person decides they're not going to pay you rent, I think it's near impossible to get them out of the house too, isn't it? It, it depends. You see, this is the fascinating stuff for me, Steve. I'm sorry. <laughs> How many people apply for being Steve's roommate? Um, it was a good, it was a good amount, maybe, I don't know, eight. And now you gotta, how do you whittle down? Is it just one conversation and you're in? It's a, it's a feel, it's the conversation and then it's the background check. Okay. So you pick one of these people, mm -hmm. they move into the house. Does that work out? Like how long is this one person there? I had a couple people in and out of that place. Cause I lived there for how long did I lived there for like three, three or four years too. So I think I had maybe three roommates in there about maybe a year a year piece you got this house you now we're going to check one box off boom i got my house i'm 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 closer to having more control over my life and i'm lucky enough that uh, i've got people that will pay the mortgage for me so somebody else is paying which is cool so what's next now because you left the actuary right you, you left that job i'm um, doing the underwriting sorry you, you left the underwriting job after 2 years so what do you do after that? So now we're talking, wait a second, eight, you did four years. That was another four years, it was 12, four, like, we're like 2014 now, roughly. Yeah, so I ended up taking a, another job kind of in, this, in the similar field, but now I'm, I'm marketing. So I'm a little bit more people focused. Um, so I'm, I'm working downtown. It's a little bit higher pace, a little bit more money. So it's, it's going well. So now you went from kind of service, a little bit sales to underwriting. And now you're back out in the world again, doing marketing, but what are you marketing? You're marketing a, a company, a product, you're marketing, what is it that you're marketing? Yeah, so I'm pretty much, it's almost sales too, because I'm, I'm not so much marketing to the public as I am taking a company to market, to like insurance carriers. So if we have a company that like builds airplanes, then I need to, it's pretty much sell them to the insurance companies to make them like insure them. Yeah. So kind of like what a mortgage broker does to like find you a loan, they're selling you to the lenders. That's what I'm doing for companies to insurance carriers, if that makes sense. It does, but I didn't realize that was a thing because anytime I needed insurance, I have a family owned business here in Palm beach that I just call and they do everything right. I never thought of it as a, I always thought of it as they jumped on the computer, saw a bunch of rates. They said, Bill, we like what's happening here. Let's go with this one. But I never saw that as a sales, salesy sort of thing. So these companies just say sort of no, or your job is to get them through that, say, application process so they, they get approved. Yeah, a lot of people don't know like what kind of goes on behind the scenes because you're talking more like life, health, small business. I'm talking about like Fortune 500 companies and their premiums are like $10 million. 
So there's a lot more that goes on like behind the scenes with that stuff. Yeah, dude, I had no idea. So it's it's hard for those companies to get that sort of insurance. You need an advocate, basically. It, yeah, it depends. It depends what it is, right? Because there's pollution risk. Like if something happens, um, like there were comp. There, like it's it's insane how much that they need. And then they have directors and officers liability coverage if the directors get sued for the decisions they make or if they plummet the stock. Like there's all kinds of stuff that the general public doesn't know about. Yeah, I, in my business, we've got a whole bunch of insurance. And every time we sign up a new client, they, they, want, they want one more thing that we've never heard of or they want to raise a, a limit on something. Cyber liability, you need 20 million here, you need this there, yeah. God forbid you have the word crypto now anywhere on your website because that just adds a whole nother level of uh, fun to, to insurance. That's a massive sort of education you're getting in terms of business, the liability, the insurance. Um, and the relationship, risk, risk management, risk management, and the relationships with all of these people. Hundred um, percent. Yep. Yeah. So, how long are you with that company doing that, that marketing? I'm there three years. And now you're bored again, or um, is because now we're getting to around 2017, right? I mean, we're getting a little closer to to kind of where we are now. So, why the switch again? Um, my boss. My boss sucked. <laughs> but you you did that for three years. It wasn't like overnight. Did he did he end up being a pain overnight? Or she, she gradually just became more and more of a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, you're like, I got to get out of here. It's not good for my mental um, mm -hmm. my mental uh, state. So I then I imagine because you're such a good saver, um, you're just like I'm I'm done, and you just don't go back to work. No. <laughs> I cannot predict Steve. It might be one of my first interviews where I just cannot get in the head of Steve here. No, got got another job, got a huge pay bump, doing pretty much the exact same thing for their competitor, and then just banking like 80, 90% of my income this, at this point, making six figures, have the roommate, and then I buy a, a separate house. So I have the condo, I rent out the room that I leave, and then I buy a house and I rent out the two rooms there. So then those new roommates, while I'm living in this house, are pretty much paying that mortgage now too. So you moved to the new house, but it's a three bedroom, I guess? It's it's a four it's a four bedroom and then I have two roommates in there. I can't imagine that at some point you don't say, I want like to live by my my kids did that. It's at some point they're just like, Dad, I can't have another roommate. I like you can't afford the rent yourself. I I know, Dad, but I can't have roommates. Like didn't you ever get to some point where you're like, I just want my own space with nobody else in it? Yeah, man, it sucked. But at the same time, I was like, I know if I'm doing this, like a lot of other people aren't doing this. So it's just putting me a leg ahead. And if I can now still save like 80% of my six figure job, it's just going to keep snowballing. You got two properties now. Mm -hmm. Those two roommates are now paying the mortgage on the on this new one. You still have a mortgage on the other one. But that's fine. Because those tenants in there are still paying that mortgage too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're starting to realize that you now have, and you got some income because it's not just break even. It's mortgage plus some income. So now you've got two sort of income streams happening. The demand for a room is not going anywhere anytime soon. Things are so expensive. And it's your ability to save 80 or 90% of your paycheck that's that's kind of facilitating this, which is amazing to me. I mean, you're kind of tired of eating um, ramen at this point, but but you don't care because you've got a 10-year plan in front of you and you're like eight years in. So how long are you with the the competitor doing the same thing? Four years, something like that. About four or five, four or five. Steve, you don't you don't fool around. I mean, I keep waiting for you to say six months. No, a year. You give them another four years. Yeah. So while I'm still working there, that's when I'm starting to see like, all right, man, in the industry and in the positions that I'm in, I'm really hitting the ceiling and the cap on income, right? So now instead of getting like six percent, ten percent increases a year, or like switching to competitors, I'm getting forty percent pops. Like now I'm getting like three and three like it's not going anywhere so i'm like all right so now how do i supplement my income in a different way to where i can keep going up and up and up so i'm like all right i've i've always kind of like thought about maybe doing more things in real estate so now how do i invest my money and so where i'm not living in the property 
to actually make more income. So that's when I start crunching the numbers across the country. Where can I get the best return? Like, where can I find good property management? Where like the law is decent? Um, so I was looking like, I probably looked in 20 different cities and I saw the best cash on cash, like the best return on your money in Chicago. I had some friends that lived there. I liked the city. I was like, all right, I'm going to invest there. So I went over there, bought some properties over there. And yeah, things have just kind of snowballed from there. What year was that when you when you enter Chicago and start buying properties? That the first rental there was 2018. 2018. Again, it's a, it's a, um, a family home. The idea is you're going to rent it. But Chicago is different than California, right? You're going to rent this to one family. This isn't like we're renting rooms anymore. It is. So we're not renting rooms, but it's not single family anymore. So I'm actually starting to buy multifamily properties to where it's not just one unit. It's anywhere from like two plus, right? So I have like some two units, I have some four units, I have like a 12 unit there. So I'm starting to scale up a little bit. I imagine that you don't know Chicago, you know, California, you live in California. So Chicago is different city, different people, different sort of angles, different sort of everything. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, what was one of the say first or early mistakes you made in Chicago because you just didn't know any better because it's not California. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's just kind of cutting my teeth with property managers and finding good property managers, especially when you're out of state, can make or break your deals, can make or break your investments. Um, that's the most costly mistake I've ever made in real estate is not cutting a property manager loose and then not having you know quality property management kind of on retainer or on backup at all times. Because when they're not doing their jobs, the tenants are screaming because something broke and it's not getting fixed, right? And Or the tenant's late and they're not on them to pay, stuff like that. Or they're putting bad tenants in, they're not checking the backgrounds on them. Like there's all kinds of things a manager can do that can mess up your investments. I have a couple homes. I have one home in Huntsville, Alabama, which, um, which is kind of like, I have my house in Miami. I love Miami. I ain't going anywhere to Miami. But Huntsville, Alabama is just a fun place. And my sister has restaurants there. So I had to buy a house. It wasn't going to be in Miami. I already have one. So I bought one in Huntsville and I love it. And my sister um, uses the house for sh celebrity chefs, actually. Some of them you see on TV. They come in, they use the house for a week and all that. But my, my thing is, is that people ask me when I bought the house, are you going to use it as a, like an investment property? And my first brain was like, no, I don't want anybody living in that house. Like I, I want to be able to spend a couple of weeks in there at a time and not feel like violated. I'm okay with the celebrity chefs because they'll, they'll come in. Maybe one chef uses the house once a month, like for a week, my brain went, it's in Huntsville. And that means that if anything breaks, I just don't want to deal with. So I don't want to deal with the hassle of owning an investment property. My question then was what kind of fee do you have to pay to a property management what should you expect to pay um, so you could roll it into a rent where the rent is still reasonable for that, say, community, right? You can't get to a point where nobody can afford it either. Right. Um, right now, I'm paying the property management company 7.5%. And that's just going to depend on where you are in the country, how many units they're managing for you, what kind of units they're managing, like in what type of areas are they luxury areas or are they more like C-class, working class areas where they're going to have maybe some tenant issues. So it just depends. But is that 7% of what you're getting for rent? It's the gross rents, yes. And then if something breaks, like the refrigerator breaks and you have to replace it, like that's coming out of your pocket, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and the repairs come out of your pocket, that the 7%, is for them to be on site and to do all the day-to-day -day management stuff. Yep, exactly. And then I set, I set a limit at 500 bucks. Anything over 500 bucks, they need to get my consent on and they need to tell me about anything below that. They can just take care of it. And then they invoice you for that. Yeah, correct. Yep. For that price. And then I'm wondering too, like when you buy a property, right? Because you're doing this now, right? You got, you, you, you're moving into this business where I imagine... At some point, you don't have to take another full-time job because you got enough income. When does that, at some point, is it 2018, 2000, 
Do you get to a point where I don't have to work full time for another company? I got enough income coming in on rentals. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, like it wasn't too long ago. I mean, we're talking a year or two ago when I hit like six figures in passive income from the rentals. So I, for, you know, from then on out, I don't have to work for anybody ever again. No. And how many, how many rentals do you have to, do you have that you achieved the per, pers personally, I own 25 and then um, I own some others with, with partners and investors. Yeah. So essentially if you want to kind of make six figures in this business model, you need to get to about 10 or 15 units or something like that, I guess. Yeah, it, it just really depends on how much cash flow it's it, the properties are kicking off and that will vary greatly across the nation. When you go and you buy, you, you choose that you're going to buy a property. Ah, oh, it's interesting. So, okay, wait, let me get back to Chicago. So you start, you start buying in Chicago. I'm imagining that the properties you're buying are fixer uppers. I imagine you have to buy these and put some money into it. I'm, I'm not putting that much money into these. So a lot of these are already fixed up. But these are in working class areas, so you really need to know where you're investing, making sure they're not not too not too tough of, of areas, right? So that's where the good property management comes into place as well, because they can advise you on where, what's good and what's not. It, where there's a, a, a demand for people wanting to rent the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm kind of curious, what are you looking? Do, do you even you must go look at these properties before you buy them? You're not just trusting property management. Yeah, so this is this is my process. So I will find the listings online. Sometimes I have the realtors in the in the area that I've already contacted on the phone, um, find them, and then they'll do the the realtor will do a FaceTime viewing with me, right? And then we'll put an offer in on a place. If it gets accepted, I will fly out for the inspection. So I'll have an actual inspector come inspect the property. I will walk the property with the inspector to make sure everything's going well. If we like it, if there's no issues, then we'll close on it. I've gone out there and I don't like it, so I don't close on it. I imagine, I'm going to take a guess here, but I imagine that if you find a property you're going to close on, there's got to be something that no matter what you want to make sure is going to give you like the appliances, right? If, if you see the appliances and they're kind of beat up, I imagine you want to replace those initially just to give you that sort of runway. Uh, yeah, appliances don't worry me at all. It's more like the building systems, like the HVAC or the electrical or the plumbing. Those are that's where that's what's going to cost you a lot of money. I'm never worried about appliances. But do you do, do you replace the appliances anyway when you go in, or you just inspect them and say, no, they deal. need to be. But the roof, so the roof, the HVAC, the heating, the AC, those are the big issues. You know, what's interesting is when I bought the house, I grew up in New York where we had basements. Miami, we don't have basements because you'd have a pool. And so I buy this house in Huntsville and they start telling me that there's a sump pump underneath the house mm. and it's connected. Listen to this story. Hopefully nobody from Huntsville hears this story. And it's connected to the, connected to the main sewer pipe. So it goes into the sewer and that's illegal. So we've got to move that to its own pipe in the backyard. Now, dude, I know shit about pump pumps and all this stuff. I, I don't I know, know anything that. about them either. Okay. So I tell them, do, I don't, whatever, do what you got to do. I, I mean, the, the <laughs> seller's got to pay for it anyway. I don't, I don't care. So they do it. Okay. I close. Now I close in January. So suddenly I'm in the house in January and I, I hear the pump the pump's underneath my bedroom. I hear the pump going on. Now, I have no idea what's happening. So I go outside. I go to look under the house. And I notice there's a big bucket. It's filled with water. And there's a pump inside there. And all the water is pumping now to the backyard where they ran this pipe. Okay, with a little sprinkler head. And my backyard is flooded. And I come to... I, now I'm researching, dude. I'm researching everything I can on some pumps. I'm asking the old seller who I became friends with. And he's like, Bill, this is why I told you not to do what you told me to do. Because in the months of January through March, the water table comes up high underneath the house. And you need this pump just to keep, there's three feet of clearance between like the ground and the house. 
So there's a crawl space. So he's like, Bill, this is why it's been connected to the sewer pipe since 1960, whenever they put this thing in. So now I'm frantic and I call the plumbing company and I'm like, dude, we got to fix this. He's like, well, it's illegal, but, <laughs> but we'll mark it down as some plumbing stuff and we'll reconnect it for you. And I was like, thank God. Nobody told me this, right? And then I went crazy, Steve. I, I knew the pump was a year old. I went and bought a marine battery and I bought a device that gives you the, the, the current. So the battery hooks up to the device and you can plug the pump in there. And then I put a camera under there too. Plugged a, 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 a Simply Safe camera under there. Because for the first year I had the house, I was paranoid. Dude. Like now I know yeah. it's normal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and now mm -hmm. when the pump goes on, I'm actually comfortable because I know everything's working, right? There's a marine battery there. So if the power goes out, I don't have to worry about the pump not working and flooding underneath there. But the house has been there since the 60s and everything was fine and dry, right? But it's like one of these things where... Dude, I don't know anything that's going on. Like, I have no idea what's happening. Like, that must have happened to you on a few. There's a, there's always a surprise. There's always a surprise. It doesn't matter what you're buying. We just, I just moved into this house right now. Me and my wife just bought this house days ago. We just moved in here. It's a flip, right? Brand new flip. They upgraded everything. There's still surprises in here. Like the HVAC wasn't working for whatever reason. Like the washer and dryer hookup, like the valve wasn't on, right? Just little, little stuff is always happening no matter what the property is. Yeah, I'm at a point in my life, actually, Steve, I'm 53. And I told my wife, we still have six and seven is still in the house. S okay, six is 15 and seven's 11 years old. And unfortunately, um, there's a 70 pound dog who's only like, like four years old or something. So let me just put it this way. I need a house at least for like another eight years. But I've already told her, I'm at a point where I don't, and this is funny because it's completely contradictory to where you where you are in your life right now. I don't want to own anything anymore. I want to rent in several cities in a high upper class sort of building where I just call somebody when the laundry machine's not working and it just gets taken care of the next day and I don't have any more stress no issues, about insurance. Yeah. And something breaking and it's not like and in all reality i have I, I i'm lucky that if something breaks i can afford to fix it but i just don't want to deal with it anymore i'm at a point where i kind of just want to rent instead yeah, of I, I get that man i get that I, I, that sounds like a good life dude you should do that <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm going to do that at some point i just wish the government made it so here's the problem Right. I, and we could talk about this, too, because it's part of your business. I wouldn't have bought the house in Huntsville, except I had gone through a divorce and had to give up one house and had to give up my retirement stuff. And now I have a salary with, and with no deductions. So I'm at a I didn't get remarried. I'm married again. And 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 all that's now kind of. But at the time. I've got a business partner and when taxes are due, I owe more than he does every single, like for two years. So like that hurts, right? And so the answer is what? You need deductions. Then the answer is what? Well, you can own a boat. I'm like, boats are worse than houses, dude. I do not want to own a boat. And then I got to pay to house it somewhere. Like I wouldn't mind a boat sitting in a dock where I could just go to the dock and hang out on the boat and it never leaves the dock, right? Like, I don't even want to put an engine in it. And my, my business partner likes, Bill, you can't not. Even my account was like, dude, you got to have an engine on. You got to pretend that it's like moving every once in a while, right? Come on, Bill. But like in Miami, that's $1,000 a month to have it on a dock that I would like to have it on where I could go and maybe sleep on it and drink. So the boat is out, right? The boat is gone. So like what else? How else do you get a deduction today other than buying property buying a house right and even there they've capped it to like ten thousand dollars a year so you don't buy the you don't want to buy a house where you're paying more than ten thousand in interest either a year though that's a big number like i don't even get close to that really but and by the way i wanted to buy in berlin and my accountant said the u.s no longer allows you to use interest on foreign properties as a deduction 
Yeah, which was a real bummer because that's where I would have bought. I wouldn't have bought. I wouldn't have bought in Huntsville. I would have bought in Berlin because that's where I really want a property. But why, why Berlin? I love that city, man. Steve, if you haven't been to Berlin, dude, I you have. gotta go there, bro. I've been to Berlin. Okay, dude. I love that city. I I go at least once a year. I love to go more if I can. And I always wanted a place there that I could just go, like a two bedroom apartment that I could have that my friends could use. Yeah. Actually, nice. I got an interesting idea for you. I'm going to remember it before we're done. Okay. But I want to get back to where I was. So I had to buy that house mainly because of the deductions that I needed for real estate. And I didn't want to turn it into rental income, though my sister pays me a little bit every month. So she can use it when a chef comes so I can play the accounting games with it. Right. I mean, like you got to have deductions in your life, but all your properties, I imagine, well, you can still have them in a business. Right. So you kind of get to, you get some of that benefit that you're doing. Uh, yeah, I get a ton of, of, of deductions. So I do own most of the properties in an LLC and then we do depreciate every part, every property which brings my tax liability way down. It's it's really awesome. The tax code is written for deductions primarily, and it's very favorable for real estate. Yeah, but right, it is. So I've got the house in Miami now, and I got the house in Huntsville, and I've got all those interest payments, and now I've got expenses around the Huntsville. I, right, I have to do all that, but it's also a lot of work, man, as an individual. You know, you gotta do the accounting every month for that too. So. It's not free. Anybody that's listening to this, like that deduction isn't free. Then you need a good accountant that knows how to work the numbers. Well, that's a good point too, because everybody's like talks about passive income and rarely is income passive, even on the properties. Yeah, you can make money while you sleep and all that. that and that's true. But there still goes into there still goes like work into even managing your property manager and staying on top of things. So I don't know. I just kind of wanted to dispel that a little bit. So how many cities? Do you have property in today? Just just in two, just San Diego and Chicago. I've been looking in in Arizona, so a couple of places in Arizona, I'm looking at Kansas City a little bit just for cash on cash returns and in terms of the rental amounts that you can get for certain purchase prices, but just two right now. Where, you know, there was a time when everybody was moving to like North Carolina. So I don't know what that market looks like anymore. But I so, think that probably so, Yeah, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, for me, I try to stay within like three, three and a half hour flight. And it has to be a direct nonstop flight. Like I wanted, my wife is from Ohio. I was like, we should purchase some stuff in Ohio. She saw his family there. We can't get a direct nonstop flight from San Diego to either Cleveland, Cincy or Columbus. I was like, it's going to take me eight hours to get there. That's way too long. So any property that I have, it needs to be within three, three and a half hours. And there needs to be a direct nonstop. That's just my own personal preference. At one point in your story, you were like, I can't work for somebody anymore because I've kind of hit the ceiling on what I can earn at this point. And so wanting to be your own person, you had already been buying these properties with the idea of, of the rental and, and all of that. I imagine that at some point you begin to say that even this is too much to manage by myself, right? At, at some point... Um, you want time and flexibility. You want to be able to go, if you want to take a trip somewhere right now, you want to be able to do it without it, without work interfering with it. You want to feel semi-retired at this point, right? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it also gets to the point, I imagine, that if you add one more property that you're to your portfolio, it you, you can't do that. It, 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 de it depends how you do it. So like, I use property managers for the out of state stuff. Um, I have some local like short term rentals here in San Diego. And if you use like just the right tech and then the right cleaners or the right maintenance guys, it becomes way more passive. Um, so I think it's just how you onboard the properties and do you have the people and the tech in place to make it more passive. And now you've got, I mean, years of experience now in doing this. You have a formula in place. You, you know what's going to work. You know what's not going to work. You got the people in place. I mean, if you enter into a new market, you got to kind of start over. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at least you'll make less mistakes, right? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully the lessons you've learned will translate into the new markets. It's not going to be hundred percent, but you'll definitely have more experience under your belt. So you won't make the big mistakes. Yeah. From what I gathered when we started our podcast today, you are 
taking this to the next level now. So instead of this being personal properties of Steve, you've started thinking about how do I create this as an investment vehicle? For, is the idea for a way of getting friends and family and people um, to benefit from what you've done here in terms of real estate? Is it, it, it tell me about that, because this is a different sort of vehicle now, right? Taking a bunch of properties and putting them together. Talk to me about how that happens and what that's really about. Yeah, good question. So at some point I run out of my own money, right? Like I don't have infinite money. I'm buying these rentals and then I cap myself just like how I got capped in the job market, right? Eventually I run out of money. So now how do I scale this and let it benefit other people too? And so that's now using other people's money to where I get a portion of the returns and they get a portion of the returns. So it's passive for them. They put their money into the fund or the syndication, whatever we're doing. And then I make some of the return as well. So it's just a win-win for everybody. Essentially, you're capped out in terms of being able to get any more loans and mortgages and things like that, which makes sense, right? I mean, there's a debt to cash ratio, ratio that you've got to maintain. Um, and that happened to me with the Huntsfell house. Like they were scrambling to figure out how to get me below that that line at one point, right? And with my business and I think I had to pay off one one little thing, just stupid, small little thing to make it work. So yeah, right? I mean, there's a limit to the amount of credit someone's going to to lend you. And you don't want to stop. You don't want to stop. So And that's that's only true on the personal side of lending, by the way. The debt to income ratio really only applies to when it's personal. But if you're buying things as a business in an LLC where the units are five or more, everything for the most part is contingent on the property and how much money the property is kicking off. So yes, they'll look at your personal credit, your personal net worth, but it's they're mostly looking at the property and how much income it can produce. But you're at least personally guaranteeing those loans. Not always, no. No, okay. That's and in nice commercial, it's a different to. beast. I've bought some property, like hunting types of properties where we've even gotten gotten some some loans, but I always remember still, I guess maybe the vendor, the the funding people that we're using still wanted like personal guarantees for some of that. Yeah, that's possible. So that's what, yeah, so that's where that I came from. So, right, this is all new to me, right? So when you're, when you're about to create some sort of investment vehicle like this, I imagine that there's a bunch of things you have to register and document with the government and you're you're changing your business from from Steve LLC buying real estate to an investment company. So that all has to be up and up and legit. So it's one thing to say let's do this. Like what's the process that you have to go through before you can take even one dollar from anybody? And now you've got an entire reporting nightmare to report back to the government and your shareholders and all that. Like sounds good on paper, but this seems massive to me. Right. Yeah. Good question. So I have a real estate attorney that will file the necessary docs with the SEC. So you can create a 506B filing or a 506C filing. So a 506B pretty much lets you invest with family and friends. They don't have to be an accredited investor, meaning they don't have to make a certain amount of money. They don't need to have a certain amount of net worth. Anybody can be in on this deal. If you have a 506B or 506C offering, the people investing in the deal have to be accredited, meaning they have to verify that they make over $200,000 a year. They've done that for a couple of years and they have a million dollar net worth. So it really depends on how you want to structure the deal on how complex it will get with reportings and filings. How do you prove that somebody is family as opposed to for the B? How do you prove that that person isn't really a C? Um, it's, it's, it's not your, it's not that you're proving somebody's family. It's really just, if you're approving, you're proving that they're an accredited investor. So you need to see tax returns, possibly deeds to properties. If they're saying that's part of their net worth, things like that. So you have your accountant sets up the right structure, new business, you get all that in, then you can start taking in funds. But even that has to be, is that just basic accounting now that you're just receiving funds and giving out dividends and yeah, yeah, we have, yeah, we're pretty set up technologically. So on my website, we have an investor portal where investors can go on, see the deal, see the returns they're getting, the payouts get 
um, sent to them via ACH instantly. They don't have to do anything, which is great. They can they can pull their K-1 tax document off of there automatically. Like it's pretty streamlined. Um, at least we've streamlined it pretty well for them. And then, okay, so you hit the ceiling. You decide, I want to raise money in this sort of investment way. And you come up with uh, the formulas on how people are going to get their return on investment and all that. And you put all that in place. How long does it take to get enough investment to be able to buy another property at that point? Like you, you're not at this point, my guess is you want to buy the property straight out or it's still going to be a loan through this with that being the collateral. Still a loan. Yeah. So you're, so the money I'm raising is for the down payment, not to buy the place cash. Um, in San Diego properties are pretty expensive. So for a down payment, we're still talking like at least a million dollars down. And that's just a down payment. That's not for the property. Yeah. So we're talking like, you know, 20 unit, 20 unit buildings. We're not just talking about a single family home. You still need a million. I was thinking like you need, you need 200,000 down for no, a million dollar property. No, and you're like, no, Bill, stop thinking no. so small. We're buying <laughs> 10, $15 million properties. Anything 10 million and below is what we're kind of looking. Yeah. 10 million and below because anything over 10 million, you're kind of like pushing up against institutional money. I'm just not that big of a player, to be honest with you. Like maybe I'll get there someday. I'm just that's not where I'm at yet. Oh my God, dude. You just said something super interesting to me. You're like, there are big boys in this pond and they're gonna buy those properties over 10 million before me. Like, yeah. Oh, there's way bigger fish in the sea. Like I'm a small cat in the sea, man. <laughs> yeah. Like I want the scrap. It, I, I'm gonna say it this way, and I don't mean it this way, but it's like I'm taking the scraps. I'm, I'm, I'm taking cool the stuff that. they don't want. I'm going to have enough of these scraps that I'm going to, it's, it's still a really large amount of, uh, Oh dude, that is super interesting. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Like it, depending on who I talk to, like, Oh man, you like have so much. Right. But then, you know, everything is relative. Right. Cause I know other real estate investors, I own 2000 units. It's like, and then I'm nothing. Right. So it just, it's, it just depends who you're talking to. Yeah. But there's also a, okay. Let, let's, we got like 15 more minutes and there's other things I want to talk about, but now that ends up. Okay. I wanted to ask this question first. How long did it take for you to be able to buy your next property? Once you put this in plan, put this in place. It, it was a lot of work, man. Like laying the groundwork for the investor portal, getting all my filing set up, finding the right people, launching like some marketing, like close to a year. But now with everything in place, it's like, you kind of have to put all that, work up front and then it gets so much easier the next time, the next time, the next time. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm glad you said that. Like I was trying to say it before. It's one thing to have the idea. It's another thing to be able to execute on this and get it Implement all. Implement everything. Yeah. And be legit. And go the stumbling blocks. And it not be a scam. Make some mistakes. Yes. Yes. It's, it's hard, I'm always man. worried like, about, I... look, Madoff ruined it for a lot of people. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'm afraid, like uh, I like investing with Edward Jones not because they're giving me the greatest return. It's because I'm going to sleep knowing that my money's still going to be there tomorrow. Like Madoff really, especially down here in South, South Florida, where he's kind of living really like scared the hell out of me. So when I honestly, when I meet a guy like you and he's like, I got these investments, the first thing my brain says is fraud, 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 fraud. So like, how do you, how do you deal with that? perception of fraud because you're not Edward Jones or Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the accredited investors have had a lot of exposure in this space and I'm not the only one doing this. Like there's thousands of me out there. So I don't want to tell somebody I'm super special because I'm not, I know what I'm doing, but there's plenty of competition out there as well. Um, I have a track record for what I'm doing. And if you're not comfortable with me, that's fine. We're not a good fit. And, you know, there's other people that want to be in my deal, so it's okay. But but that's not fair, Steve. It's not that I don't want to do. I, I, I okay. I'm gonna push back at you on that. That's not fair, okay? Because again, I think that there are say people like myself who would love to put ten thousand dollars somewhere, not in Edward Jones, um, in some investment there. I don't know if ten thousand is too small for you. What's your smallest number? So the, the minimum investment's 50K. Okay. So I want to put 50K, Steve. I want to be your, I want to be the, the small fish in your pond. Giving, giving you 50K and you stealing it isn't going to change my life. 
I, I wouldn't invest 50K if that was going to change my life. And it wouldn't change my life. But I wouldn't be happy about it. So, like, how do you, maybe you don't care. Maybe you're at a point where you don't care about my money because if you have to work hard to prove that you're legit, then I'm not the investor that you want. Is that is that basically the idea? Kind of. I mean, we provide, I provide a background check on myself too, to the investors, like a criminal backer background check, because that's what I would want if I was giving you my money. So I always try to put like myself in somebody's shoes. Like if I'm giving you my money, what do I need to feel comfortable? So that's what we try to do. And then you're a part of the LLC that we're buying. So you have ownership rights on the property. It's not like I can just take the property out from under you. So there's like legal documents giving you rights on the property. So that's like kind of leverage that you have if that makes you feel more comfortable. Investing in a single property at any given time. So every Correct. investment is, it's not a big, okay. I thought this was like a big fund where all the properties are kind of funded together. So I'm getting some small percent of everything. I'm buying into, into one property, your next property that you're looking to buy. Correct. So, so some people do a fund where you pretty much give them your money, your money and they go do whatever they want with it. Right. But in this case, um, we're syndicating deal by deal. So you are a part owner in this one property. You are in the LLC documents as a part owner. I like that. I like that so much better than the other model. Yeah. So I probably should explain that better earlier. No, because that to me reduces that fraud idea that I'm, and I have some legal percent ownership in the property itself. Yeah, that reduces everything. Because me and the other in the other model, my brain's like, dude, what makes you just run, decide to shut down tomorrow? And and then I'm, where, where am I going to do? I'm going to cry, and I'm a small fish, fifty thousand. The the government will not, like will just tell me to go away, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I see your perspective now. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So having that is super interesting. Mm -hmm. And then we can we communicate with the investors every single month. A newsletter goes out on what's happening with the property, what's going on. Like, I don't think you can ever over communicate on stuff like that. I'm buying in on the property. The idea isn't really that there's going to be a sale. I mean, I honestly would imagine that the idea is long, long term holding of the property. It's all about rent. So usually there is a sale. We target anywhere from like three to seven year hold. So we'll go in there and do some light cosmetic upgrades, bump the rent, and then um, we'll be able to sell it for much more in about five years. And then that's when you'll get your big pop at the end of the, uh, the, end of the term. So let me, oh, this just popped into my head. Okay. I rented a place before I got married back in 2019 in Coral Gables, Miami. I thought they were high as a kite, but it was a, upscale building and they wanted 2500 bucks a month i didn't want to live in crap so i i rented the place it was perfect a one bedroom it was beautiful dude okay i but 2500 was like my top i wasn't going over that i could afford it i did it okay after the year is about up at that point i i, I was spending all my time with my wife at her house we're getting married and I have a niece and a nephew. I'm just setting up the stage, a niece and nephew who need a place to live. And I say, go live in this place for a couple months because in a couple months I'm getting rid of it. So they do that with the idea that we're going to find them a place to live. And dude, in 2020, you cannot find this. Okay. When this, when the letter comes in to renew, if they want 3000 now from me, and if I didn't already have it, they wanted like 3,300. And we start searching for apartments all over Miami in the area. And what you can get for 2,500 bucks was nauseating. I ended up just biting the bullet and letting them stay there again for another year where they shared rent. Okay. My point was, is that I felt like, and I want your opinion on this. I felt like what happened, at least in Miami, was during the pandemic, a lot of landlords weren't getting their rent because they didn't have to pay because the government was protecting everybody from being evicted out of their homes. And the landlords at that point decided that I could be wrong. This was my guess that that once that law was kind of out and, and things were renewing that they were going to somehow try to get their money back. I mean, these were 30 plus percent rate increases all over Miami on rent, dude. I, it was it's and I was meeting people when we were looking at apartments saying, yeah, I've got to move 40 minutes away because I just can't afford to live here anymore. 
um, 30 plus percent. That popped in my head because you had rentals during the pandemic. And I, I'm just wondering, did you have problems with people paying rent during that time? Yeah, at, when, right when this started, I was terrified. I was like, dude, am I gonna get wiped out right now? Like I was really scared, um, but it actually went very smooth. Um, I think I had one or two evictions, it's not, which isn't bad. They stayed in there for like six to eight months. It, not great, but it didn't kill anything. You know, when you have, that's like the good thing about scaling and getting more and more units because it's not like one single family home. If they stop paying rent, you're kind of screwed. With multifamily, if one person starts paying rent out of 10, you're going to be okay. Um, but yeah, we didn't really have a lot of issues collecting rent, rent, thank God. And then I think our increases were like five to 10%, just depending on, on where it was at. How do you decide what the rent increase is going to be for the next year? Yeah, good question. Oh, uh, we just look at what the competition's doing. So when our leases come due, we'll see what's what's happening in the area. If other people have bumped theirs up, then we'll probably bump bump ours up too. That's interesting, and I'm sure some people are looking at yours, your rents <laughs> to do that. So it ends up 100. percent It's all about like it's all about comps and what what is out there for other people, just supply and demand. Do you do the same thing too, where you try to make sure that not all your leases are ending on the same month, so you give deals to different timeframes? We haven't consciously done that. I, I think they're just randomly spread out throughout the year. Yeah, because anytime I've rented, it's been like, here's your rate for these terms. And I'm always like, why is the eight month less than the 12? And they're like, because we don't want all these leases ending and that gives us a better distribution. Yeah, no, I, I've never done that. Okay. So that's, yeah, I, I just can't imagine what happened to Miami like overnight with, with the rents and yeah, that's that's a wild. I didn't know it was that high. Yeah, I don't know. I have, uh, no idea. Uh, and luckily now the lease is up for them and they found a place for 2500 in the area. So I think some rents have come down a little bit or the reality of life is starting to kick in again around here. I hope. I haven't seen the place that they were happy with. So <laughs> I don't know, but they, they can't <laughs> stay where they are now. I can't do that anymore. I had this idea one time. My friends and I had this idea, Steve. Now, it's not a business idea, but I, it popped in my head, so I want to share this with you, okay? We all had the idea. There was, um, there was like four of us. We never did it, however. I wish we had, but we hadn't, we've never done it. The idea is that we would each buy, um, to start off with, we'd each buy one property somewhere on the planet that we all wanted to stay at. So one was going to buy in Tenerife. Uh, we'll buy in Berlin or we'll buy wherever, right? And the idea is that we own our own property, we maintain our own property, but it's in it's almost like our own private Airbnb. We we keep it in rotation just for us. That way it's like we really have four properties instead of just one. Yeah, whether whether and then eventually maybe we can each you know have two and then you have these in rotation for private use. So like interesting idea, right? Like you gotta have close buddies who will treat the properties like they're their own. Well, you can still make, and you can still make money doing that too. I mean, it's not as, if you just have the right person to tell you how to set up an Airbnb too, you can block off a calendar for half of the year for your buddies. And then you guys can rent it out for the half of the year, automate the messaging to the guests, to the cleaners, and then it'll pay for itself if you just know how to do it. So I'm more than help, happy to help you guys with that for free on the side if you want. <laughs> you can, you can do it, but I'm going to go back to my, personality of I got two things that hold me back from putting it on an Airbnb right and it's and it's silly but it's just it's just my personality like I don't want to add more maintenance to my life right now I'm trying to go lower maintenance not higher maintenance so having a property and attaching and having to manage like I know I can make money doing it I just don't want to add more maintenance to my life right now and two it's still that idea of like, it's invasive. I, I don't care if my friend shows up, like I love them to death, the strangers. And I do it already in the Huntsville house, like I said, with the chefs, but at least my sister knows them. So at least it's somebody that my sister knows, like not a complete stranger. I can't get, I can't get past it. I, I wish I could. I just can't. I think that's okay, man. Like I, I respect that. I think we're just at different points in our life too, right? Like I'm trying to maximize, go hard, push, and then, you know, you're kind of like, you want to chill and you want your own space. And I, I totally get that. And that's probably how I will be eventually. That's just not where I'm at. 
Yeah, 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 it's cool though. Um, all right, Steve, this was really fascinating for me. And I kind of find it interesting that you didn't really, you knew that you wanted to, I, here's my guess. Here, this is this is what I heard um, from listening to your story. Always had in your head at an early age that you wanted to be your own person and in control of your life. And you didn't know necessarily how you were going to get there, even getting out of college, but you knew that that you wanted to be there. And so those jobs out of college started allowing you to kind of get an idea of what would allow you to own your own place and be your own person. And your ability to save is insane. So that was the starting capital you needed to get going. This me very much like you. I, I I didn't have starting capital coming out of any family. My family didn't have that kind of money. In fact, the business that I have now, I started it with my after I failed a business and was two hundred fifty thousand in the hole. I used my last ten thousand to start this business, right? And don't raise money. I didn't not raising money to do that. Like you need some starting capital. You needed a lot more because you wanted to buy real estate in Southern California, but you found a way to do that through saving. And then you found something that you were passionate about with real estate and you continue to find inventive, cool ways to raise the capital you need to grow that business. And now you've got the ability to include friends and family to get in on, on that, which I love my, my sister and her, her husband, or in the restaurant business. And they're they're now thinking about when we open up the next restaurant, can we do it in a way where we can invite family and friends? Because we've proven that we're successful running businesses. So that's not a fear anymore. It's more like if we're gonna do it again, let's in let's include the people we love. I, I get a sense that that's what you've done here. It's like I'm successful with this now. So I'd love to include everybody around me so they don't feel left out. Hundred percent, and it was kind of the the proof of concept, right? Proof of concept with my money first to make sure that it works, and then I'm comfortable bringing on people once I cut my teeth, get the knowledge, and actually show that it's a viable opportunity and makes money. Then I'll bring on other people's money. It's one thing to lose your money, but like if you lose somebody else's money, I'd feel terrible about that. I don't, I, I couldn't do that. I know. Um, I I lost some people's money in my first business, and it does. It still haunts me today and that was 2008 is when that business finally had to close we were we were doing we were basically zillow before zillow came out maps of real estate listings with avms and oh man you should have had me cold calling for you in 2008 <laughs> <laughs> nah dude i could sit i have a whole show of every mistake we made in that business like that i never made again right like normally your first businesses don't pan out they usually say your third business but Steve, you did it on your first one, dude. That's that's really, really, really nice. So I'm I'm happy. I mean, we all, you have up and downs, and you have the the close calls, and um, it's not all peaches and cream, everyone. When I'm saying Steve did it on his first business, I'm saying that he was fortunate enough to correct quickly to not lose everything, and that doesn't happen to a lot of people because you don't have enough experience to know. Oh, hi, right, man. We are out of time, uh, Steve. If anybody wants to sort of talk to you or reach out after the show, after listening to the show, like what's the best way for people to reach out to you? And we'll put it in the show notes too. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'm on all social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok. Um, St Steven Waselk, W-A-S-Y-L-K-I-W is the last name. Um, Magna Vita Investments is our company. You can go to our website, see what we're doing there. And then I have a YouTube channel called Realizing Your Potential, kind of talk about financial freedom and, you know, getting that stable financial aspect of your life to pursue your passion and purpose from there. Oh, I love that. Uh, well, we'll make sure we get all that on the show notes. And if anybody's listening, even if they're not in tech or in tech and really thinking about being an entrepreneur and, and, and also technically trying to also supplement income. And so the big thing is that you just can't have all your eggs in one basket, right? Correct. And yep. like, you know that, Steve, and we didn't really talk about where else you're putting money outside of real estate. And I'm going to guess that you've got something somewhere because if one sector completely dies, you need the other sectors to keep you keep you afloat. I have a little bit in the stock market, but predominantly it is real estate. And like for me, just for those that are listening, I have my tech company. I also 
We we'll also buy a lot of land for more hunting properties than than um, like what you're doing, Steve. But it's just you got to have the. And I'm always looking for some other business that is completely different, just to kind of diversify that way. Yeah. Well, and then I know you do have like a lot of tech listeners, so I do want to throw out there. I just um, wrote a book, How Artificial Intelligence Can Make You More Money in Real Estate. So if they found this this you know episode interesting, maybe they can go check that out. Um, it's on Amazon. I think my assistant just got it on like Google Books and Apple Books, so they can check that out as well. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Time out, time out, time out. I I'm going to take five more minutes now. I was going to close this down, but now I'm taking five more minutes. Okay, Steve, how are you even remotely capable of writing this book about AI? Talk to me about that. Where does that come from, Steve? Yeah, so it's it's a short book. It's an ebook. It's like, I don't know, 60 pages, something like that. I didn't want to make any fluff. It's really just like how we're using AI for like predictive analytics, what we're doing for like property management in terms of bots, how we use it in marketing, like kind of stuff like that. Brilliant. So this is sort of models and tooling you built to help run uh, this business, this investment business that you've, what made you decide to put that in a book? Why share that with your competitors? I don't know. I've always been just open about the info that I put out there. I feel like 90% of the people won't do anything with it anyway. So um, I thought it's something that interested me. And it was a, even a way for me to put all my thoughts together and it ended up making me smarter in the field and having to do more research on it. So it kind of benefited me as well. That's super fascinating. What's the title of that again? So it's called How Artificial Intelligence Can Make You More Money in Real Estate. And we just launched it like days ago. So we just put it up. It just got just went live this week. And uh, this week being February 9th, for those of you that are listening, February 9th, 2023. Um, that's brilliant, man. Congrats on that. It's not easy, even a small book, to write a book, man. Right? You got to dedicate a lot of time to that. It was an insane amount of work. Like, if I knew how much work it was going to be, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> like, oh my God. Everybody who writes and eventually publishes a book says the same thing. I've written two books. I don't know how I did the second one, but it's insane. Well, I'm going to have to check out yours then. It, well, I'm I'm writing programming books, dude. It has nothing okay. to do with I, I you ain't gonna help me out. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know I, there's a I um when I was in college, I was in a fraternity, right? I pledged a fraternity. And when you get done with that, the saying is always, it's the best time you never want to have again. Yeah. Right? The yeah. best time pledging that you never ever want to have again. And a book is kind of similar, except it's not the best time. <laughs> yeah. What fraternity were you in? Uh, Sigma Pi, which is like the third largest uh, national, uh, I think, fraternity in the country. Sigma Pi. I was in Kappa, I was in Kappa Sig. I didn't know if uh, we were going to be fraternity bros or not. Uh, maybe, oh, that would have been funny. Huh? You never know. <laughs> no, you never know. The world is small. All right. We're, we're totally out of time. Thank you, Steve, for sharing all of that. This is Bill and Steve signing off from the R Labs podcast. Thanks for hanging out with us, and I hope to see everybody again real soon.